really excited to tell you about our trip, and we're excited that a number of the students that were on the trip are here. So afterwards, you know, you have opportunity if you want to get personal reflections from the students about this trip as well. Um, so I'm going to start it off, and we're going to kind of tag team back and forth. This is a Gen 2 penguin, the best penguin that we saw on our trip, doing its thing, which is laying on an egg on its cool rock nest, which we'll hear more about later, I think. Um, but before we start into lots of beautiful pictures, uh, I just wanted to tell you that this was an academic experience, we promise. Um, this is about the natural history of Antarctica, and so we as a class met at 7 a.m. on Wednesday morning, just during the fall semester, to start learning about the Antarctic ecosystem before we went on the trip. Um, students got three credits for the class, and this satisfied their international perspectives uh, requirement for, for course credit as well. And we had a variety of objectives, but they were essentially to just better understand the Antarctic ecosystem. What is it all about? Why is it special? Um, what's the history? What are some of the threats currently to the ecosystem? And hopefully some of that will become clear as we talk about this in this talk. And so before we go to Antarctica, I thought, we thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about how Antarctica came to be. And so if we go back hundreds of millions of years ago, yes, Kevin is amazed, hundreds of millions of years ago, we had this amazing kind of mass of land all in one cool smoosh together. Um, Form. And over time, those pieces of land started to break apart from one another. And Antarctica was connected down here to Australia and Africa and South America, and it broke off and made its way from kind of more of a temperate area uh, placement on the globe down to the bottom of the world. Um, so we, it's one of the polar regions, and obviously the Arctic is the other polar region. And they are similar in some ways and quite different in other ways. And so that's where Antarctica started, and there's lots of interesting fossil evidence to support that the Antarctica was very different a long time ago from what it is today. Today, it is at the bottom of the world, and it holds a lot of S. It is the, on average, highest continent, it is the driest continent, it is the coldest continent, and it is the windiest continent. Um, but it's not anywhere near the biggest, it's only the fifth largest continent. Um, it's a continent that is basically two parts, East Antarctica, which is above sea level, and West Antarctica, which is below sea level, and then West Antarctica has this really cool peninsula that factors into our story that shoots out from it. Uh, it is a continent of land, rock, covered by ice. The thickest ice is three miles thick. It is also really, really important in the global climate uh, for a variety of reasons. It very importantly, it's home to the bulk of the fresh water that the globe has, frozen on this giant ice sheet covering the continent. Um, this is Antarctica with some landmarks, continent divided by basically the southern extent of the Andes. And I want, we wanted this slide in here because this is where we went, right here. So it's a huge continent. We saw a whole ton of really cool stuff right here. Um, and so that's where you're going to see pictures from. It's just the tippy tip of Antarctica. And it's really, the whole continent is not super easy to access. And this is really some of the most beautiful, some of the most exciting things to see. And so hopefully you'll see that when we show you some of the pictures we're going to get to here in a minute, I promise. The last thing I want to show you is just a picture that I find Amazing, it highlights another kind of special aspect of Antarctica, which is Antarctica, unlike the Arctic, is a continent, it's a landform surrounded by ocean. And the Arctic is ocean surrounded by land. And there's two kinds of ice in Antarctica that are very different and <coughs> very important for, for global climate. The first is Antarctica itself, which is covered by ice that is fresh water. And then it's surrounded seasonally by sea ice, which is salt water, which at the deepest, the heart of winter actually effectively doubles the size of Antarctica. And this beautiful white, surrounded by all of this blue, 
plays a really important role in reflection, reflecting solar radiation um, away from the Earth, keeping us, keeping us cool. So, so that's just kind of what Antarctica looks like in the deep, dark winter. We were there during the summer when most, but not all of this sea ice had gone away. And this is our group, many of whom are in here today. Raise your hands, wave a little. There they are. Woo! Um, this is us in Ushuaia, tingling with anticipation to get onto the ship, which is where Steve is going to take over. Okay, thanks, Julie. All right, so I thought we would just uh, kind of give you a little bit of background about some of the logistics and kind of how we, uh, how we got around and, and where we stayed and where our home was uh, as part of this trip. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So, this is, this is our vessel, so trips to Antarctica are boat-based, so we did not, I'll preempt this question, we did not spend any time at research stations or anything like that. That's off limits to the general public. There are special permissions for that. So this was our home, motor vessel Ushuaia, and it's a, a fairly decent sized boat. It actually turns out it's a renovated NOAA icebreaker that's been sold to a tour company. In this case, it was Antarctica, uh, and then they go ahead and do expeditions on it. Capacity is 88 passengers and 44 crew. So uh, by Antarctic vessel standards, maybe a little bit smaller than average, but certainly for an intimate experience there, uh, spot on in terms of that. And I think uh, most folks that took the class, and certainly Julie and I agree that this was a really nice sized vessel for this kind of trip. Um, and just another image of, of that, this was at Deception Island, so our kind of our first landing there, and a pretty typical uh, part of the environment there is penguins and lots and lots of snow and ice. So very typical there. This is also the only time that we experienced any snow was the first couple days of the trip in this sort of upper part of the Antarctic Peninsula. And I'll get to the itinerary in a moment. Um, one of the things that we, uh, that we learned about is the measures that are taken to preserve the Antarctic environment from invading species. And one of the rituals that you go through is every time you get on and off the boat, you go through a boot rinse. Well, that's what this is. So you're, there's some uh, water that's got some, some chemicals in there, some uh, bleaches or detergents of some sort, mild ones, of course. So you walk through that, you scrub your boots, you walk through the next one to rinse, you scrub your boots, and then you get onto the Zodiac. You repeat that process when you come back on. And there's a lot of um, uh, procedures in place to try and prevent invasive species from getting established in our areas because it's such a pristine environment still to this day. In terms of uh, our home away from the big boat, we spent a lot of time in the Zodiacs. So this is the, one of the Zodiacs. We'll see a little bit more about that in the video. Um, but we did um, all of our landings using these small boats here. Typically, there were eight to 10 people on them. This is uh, members of our class right there on one of the landings like that. So lots of time in Zodiacs to get from point A to B off the boat. And then um, one of the real challenges, of course, is finding a place, a toehold, if you will, to land those Zodiacs. Uh, because it's all ice and snow, and there's ice floating around in the water, safety is a, is a premier concern. And so this actually is one of the landing sites. And the Zodiac came right up there, and he actually stepped onto this rock, up onto the ice, and then walked back there. And there were uh, folks from the tour company there to help you get off of that. And that actually was a, a pretty good landing by some of the standards that we saw. So there's a lot of care taken just to get you a little bit of toehold there. So where did we go? Uh, our trip was actually, it wasn't called Classic Antarctica. This is a map that they provided us. It was the Weddell Sea trip which had an extra couple of days. But uh, we started over here in South America, so this isn't oriented correctly. Came down in, crossed through the South Shetland Islands, up here to the Antarctic Sound. Uh, tried to make a couple landings there the first day, 70, 80 knot winds, we were unable to do that. So then we decided to make a snap decision and came back to Deception Island, made our first landings there. Then went down into the Bransfield Strait, made a number of landings here. Came back up to Antarctic Sound, got another landing in there, and actually had a chance to spend some time along the the edge of the pack ice, back to the South Shetlands, two more landings, and then back home. So that's kind of our itinerary there. Total of, I guess by technical standards, 10 landings. Eight of those we actually set foot on something. Two of them were Zodiac cruises, and of all 10 of those, one of them was on the Antarctic continent proper. The rest were all on islands. The second thing I just wanted to share with you, just some, some images about the people of the trip, and that includes uh, our group and others. So again, here's a, a shot of our it's most of our class there in typical gear and typical environment. This was taken on top of Danko Island, one of the early landings that we made. And of course, you know, lots of snow here, lots of ice in the background, uh, open bay there. So it was back around to the right there, so a fairly typical view for most of our landings. These are the scientific staff. And I think, uh, I think folks will agree we're really happy with 
the leadership that the boat provided. We felt like that was a really nice benefit of this trip. So this is Augustin, who was the, the, uh, the tour leader, if you will, the scientific leader. And then uh, Bolivia and Vidya, I think, is that right? Yeah, they had similar sounding names. So the two of them were also um, some of the naturalists on board. So they were uh, extremely helpful, extremely knowledgeable, and they made up all of the landing parties and participated mm -hmm. in those things as well. So uh, very, very good staff on there. Um, spent a lot of time on the boat. The landings really didn't comprise very much, so an average landing might have been maybe two, two and a half hours, some are a little shorter, some stretch maybe three hours. That means you're spending a lot of time on the boat, and of course it's uh, it's daylight most of the time out there. It never really gets truly dark. Uh, kind of got sort of duskish for a few hours in the middle of the night. So you spend a lot of time on the boat looking at things like ice, taking pictures of ice, looking at whales, uh, things of that nature. So it's nice, really nice large front deck. Um, I should mention that those sea conditions are pretty typical of what we experienced once we got across the Drake Passage. Notice it's not really rough. Uh, nice sunny days for the most part, really spectacular weather on our trip compared to uh, what it could have been. And then when we made the landings, of course, this is a really typical view there. So you're walking around in snow. Uh, the landings were very carefully scouted by the naturalists. So they get on shore ahead of the group. They pick out two or three vantage spots. When you landed, you were given instructions. You can go walk over to Augustin over there and see a penguin colony. Walk over to Bolivia here. There's some elephant seals displaying. Stay behind this line, etc. It was very structured, very efficient, very, very well run. And you certainly were able to get very close to, to all the animals. Uh, this is just some Gen 2 penguins. And a typical scene there uh, of what we might have encountered on land. And then this is just another example of the group there. Um, we'll see a little bit better photos of these later. But these are some Waddell seals. And it turns out that a couple of them are actually doing what they call singing. They make a little kind of a musical bubbling note. They have to be dead silent. You can hear them making that kind of a chirping. It's apparently unusual to hear that. And so the whole group of folks were here being quiet. And I know this was one of the individuals that was singing right there in front of us. It was one of the eeriest and coolest mammal experiences I've ever had. And I think that was probably the case for lots of folks. I really did. And then we, of course, occasionally had time to have some fun. Uh, and so this was uh, one of the other um, landings at Hydruger Rocks. And there was a nice little hill there, so lots of the folks, including some of our students, were taking a little short sled ride to the bottom. It wasn't very far there, so certainly had some time to, to have some fun. But everything, again, was structured to minimize impact on the environment. And this was just on top of some fresh snow there. And then, of course, some of you have seen this, but uh, one of the really cool opportunities was to take a polar plunge. And so all of our class had, did, took that opportunity. Um, it had just finished snowing before this, uh, so it was quite cold. I don't know what the water temperature was. I don't think any of us hung around long enough to take it, but it was probably you know, in the 40s or something like that. It's on top of an active volcano, so there was some steam coming up with a little bit of heat, but it was still pretty cold, so we, we did the polar plunge. And then uh, just a picture of the entire, or most of the entire group that was on the boat up on top of another one of the landings here, kind of a nice group photo. Again, uh, this is a, a rare situation where you had if you had some exposed ground up top, and that'd be the kind of place where things like penguins might nest as well. Okay, so Drake Passage. So I'll kind of take you down there in the Drake Passage, just a few slides. This is um, sort of a unique environment that you have to cross going to and from Antarctica. And it's famous for having really, really rough weather, uh, the roaring 40s, and you know, famous for all sorts of seas. By those standards, we had a really, really easy passage. It was rough starting out to go down and got calmer as we approached the Shetland Islands. Coming back, I think the first mate said it was his second calmest crossing in 60. It was very, very, it was the Drake Lake, if you will. So we made that crossing at the front end of the trip, and then again at the back end. And the Antarctic Convergence, which is that clash between the warmer, temperate waters and the Antarctic sea waters, uh, we took past that, passed into that uh, early in the morning on the 9th of December, spent the entire trip there, and would have come back out of it sometime on the 8th of December on our return. That's a real sharp uh, thermocline in the water with respect to water temperature. And you see a big difference in terms of the wildlife on either side of that. So what did we see? Well, it's a land of seabirds and albatrosses, so um, lots of cool wildlife there with respect to birds and some marine mammals. This is a, a, a um, black-browed albatross, a really common bird. Um, we also got a chance to see some of the, the really big albatrosses. This is a northern royal albatross, famous for having, well, being one of the two birds that has the longest wingspan of any bird in the world. So that's about 11 and a half or 12 foot wingspan. So really large bird. Other kinds of albatrosses, one of my favorites was the light-mantled albatross. These guys were really gorgeous. Nice kind of bluish eye there, and kind of light color on the back. 
We didn't see very many of those, but they were really striking when we did have them around the boat. And then probably the most familiar seabird that we saw in the crossings and also uh, in and around Antarctica was the Cape Petrel, also called a Cape Pigeon because it kind of looks like a rock pigeon. These guys were constantly flying around the boat, and, uh, hanging around the back, etc. They were really, really ridiculous. And then some other things like a southern bomar, which is just another kind of shearwater or petrel. So lots and lots of seabirds there. It was really fun to, to watch them follow the boat. And of course, the Drake Passage, despite not being in Antarctica proper, also has some penguins. And this is a Magellanic penguin, an adult on the left with the baby on the right. It's fledged. So it was our first introduction to a couple species of penguins before we got to Antarctica proper. OK, I'll turn it over to Julie. So one of the most spectacular parts of Antarctica, which I really didn't appreciate until I was there, is the ice and the scale of the ice on the land and the scale of some of these icebergs are just hard to even describe. <coughs> but we're gonna, I'm going to try. Um, so, so we're just going to walk through some pictures and talk a little bit about, about some of the, the, the snow and the ice uh, that we saw. And so we, we did a lot of sailing from island to island and always in an environment like this. Most of the time, we were really, really lucky that it was very sunny. There were a couple of overcast, one blizzard day, which was the day we swam. Um, but mostly, it was just lovely. It was just like, this is stories and stories tall. And it, it's hard to fathom it without being there and realizing, like if you had a little zodiac boat right there, it'd be like a little dot that you could hardly see. And so we saw a lot of, of glaciers, um, glaciers, as I'm sure you all know, for, are formed from snow, and it's too cold there for the snow to melt. So just ye year after year after year after year, it compresses, and further underneath the snow, it becomes ice. And this whole glacier is constantly moving due to gravity down towards the water. And then enormous 20-story, 30-story, 50-story buildings occasionally cab off as icebergs, and then they float around in the ocean, um, wandering around and over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, hundreds of years, they change shape and conformation, and then they melt away. And they're contributing fresh water to the seawater. And so we just saw lots of just remarkable continental snow and ice, as well as remarkable uh, evidence of breaking up of the sea ice, given the time that, of year we were there, which is just creeping in to summer. We had a fair amount more sea ice than I think we had anticipated, than the, than the boat people had anticipated. Uh, so just beautiful white contrasting against blue water. Um, just these beautiful, incredible mountains covered with snow. And then also icebergs. And so we saw icebergs of various shapes and sizes and colors. The blue icebergs are the ice that is really old and has been compressed so much that there's hardly any air left in there, so what you see with your eye is blue. Um, we had these kind of weird cone-shaped icebergs, and sometimes they would have a little bit of red, maybe a little bit of algae or a little bit of brown, which was sediment that they may have picked up as they were cascading down and then eventually calving into the ocean. And then the scale of these things they're huge ones, and over time they melt to tiny ones, but they start just ginormous. Um, and we got to take Zodiac cruises around some of these. So this is us and cruising around amongst icebergs, freshwater, and sea ice, um, salt water. And then because we were there kind of at the start of summer, especially when we were up in that Antarctic Sound, we were trying to get into the Weddell Sea, we encountered a fair amount of this, which is ocean, sea ice that hasn't melted yet, trapping an iceberg behind it. And so this, I think the captain measured is what, 20 story building high of, of, of iceberg. And so we saw others that were bigger than this, just, just remarkable in, in scale. And then again, this is the sea ice, uh, kind of uh, breaking up against um, one of the islands that we were cruising by. And then every continent, uh, continental or um, island landing that we made was primarily walking through snow. Um, uh, lots of type opportunities to hike uphill like the penguins do, also hiking around on the beaches, but most of it was on snow. 
with some exposure of the bedrock. So less than 1% of the continent is actually not covered in ice. Because we're at the peninsula, we got to see a lot more of that 1% than, than average. It's not randomly distributed across the, the continent. And so Antarctica continent proper and its um, affiliates, the Antarctic islands, are not home to a whole lot of charismatic megafauna. They're home to a suite of plants mosses, lichens, liverworts, um, two flowering plants. Um, this, these are some lichens. This is one of the flowering plants, not your typical flower form. It's a, a hair grass. The pearlwort is the other flowering plant that was also there while, and out while we were there. Um, but in terms of animal life, most of the animal life that makes its home on the continent is actually uh, an invertebrate form. Um, so most of the wildlife that we saw that were charismatic vertebrates use the, the continent as a part of their life cycle, but they don't live there exclusively. And so I am going to talk about mammals, and then Steve, of course, will talk about birds. So there aren't a whole lot of mammals in Antarctica, but there are some particularly exciting mammals um, that we got to see. Um, and some of them, like the birds that Steve's going to talk about, are there's not a whole lot of diversity, but they're fairly highly specialized to be able to live in this kind of extreme environment. Um, they have some pretty cool adaptations, which I'll mention as we go. Um, with respect to mammals, we saw whales and seals and dolphins. Mostly the dolphins were in the Great Passage on the way down. Once we got down, to uh, the land, the waters around the islands and the continents. We saw mostly, with respect to whales, humpback whales. Um, we actually happened upon a, a kind of a pod of humpback whales, about 30, that were feeding. And so the whole ship got to watch them for about an hour as they made their way past us feeding. And humpback whales are particularly fun to watch because they raise their flukes in the air when they die. And so you can actually keep track of them fairly easily and watch them dive. And all of their flukes are individually fingerprinted. They're basically unique descriptors of the individual. So there's a big database of humpback whale flukes to tell the researchers who study these who's who. So you can tell the animals apart with the flukes and they like to show them off as they go diving. We saw a sign mostly blow of a handful of other whale species as well. But these were the guys we actually got to see reasonably large parts of them. Reasonably. That's still really big. Whales are big. Okay? So, <laughs> a lot of whales. Um, and then the other mammal we saw a lot of was the Weddell Sea. Uh, seal. Weddell Seal. Um, and these guys are big, blubbery, cute, Seals. They are true Antarctic seals, which means they are highly adapted to the Antarctic environment. Some of the species we saw were sub-Antarctic species that spend part of their lives in the Antarctic. The Weddell seal spends its total life on the ice um, down in Antarctica. They have remarkable adaptations with their front teeth that allow them to live under the ice and then scratch open breathing holes to come up and breathe occasionally. And unfortunately, as those teeth wear as they age, a lot of times they drown, which is grim, but we didn't see any of that. We just saw them eating. <laughs> and we saw them singing, which was like, which was remarkable. I don't, I don't think we, it's unfortunate none of the GoPros really captured it because they, they're laying on the ice right in front of us with the picture that Steve showed, and they're squeaking and chirping, and it's set, and they have neighbors, so it sounds like they're talking back and forth in this, like, crazy alien language, and even the guides were quite surprised to hear any of this. So it was a pretty special opportunity, and they didn't seem bothered at all by us just sitting there quietly watching them. So that was one of the most spectacular mammal encounters, I think, for most of us. Uh, the other uh, seal species we saw a fair amount of was the elephant seal. So these guys are not true Antarctic species. They um, go uh, into more temperate areas during certain parts of the year, and then they come down to the Antarctic in other parts of the year. These guys are not reliant on ice. They prefer to haul out actually on rocky surfaces, and the time we spent 
But the biggest group of uh, elephant seals was with a herd of juvenile males who were practicing and demonstrating for us their male-male um, competition. And so adult males will have this giant proboscis like an elephant, kind of. Um, and they are really big, and they guard hundreds and hundreds of females in their harem. And so these guys were practicing with each other um, that, that competition. And you can see that even though they're juveniles, <coughs> They have done a lot of fighting, even as youngsters, and you can see that here, <coughs> where they would they break, basically snort and blubber and scream at each other and kind of run up like a big fat blubbery elephant seal can and pound into each other and then bite on each other. And so we got to see kind of a lot of this um, just right in front of us as we were wandering around that particular landing. And so there are a number of other whale species, there's a number of other seal species, but these were the ones that we most frequently encountered on our trip. And the final one, which you just saw once, is the crab eater seal. And it is also, like the Weddell seal, a truly Antarctic species. Similar adaptations for surviving in that extreme landscape. Oh, and the leopard seal, I keep forgetting. Yeah, yeah. So we also saw the leopard seal. And leopard seal we weren't even supposed to see, and then we saw it right after we were told we were going to see it. Um, and this guy came right up to our zodiac. So this picture is us taking it, like it's here, right here. Um, and so what you'll see when we show the video is this guy swimming around the boat and under the boat. And, and this guy is the super predator of the seal world down there. And he eats other seals, and he eats penguins and driveways that we didn't get to see. But that was the other seal species. We saw leopards once, crab eaters once, and then lots of whales. Wow, dead birds, right? <laughs> Not what everybody's been waiting for. No. Uh, so uh, I think birds won the diversity uh, battle with respect to mammals, although it'd be hard for us to say which was cooler. But we saw about 77 species for the entire trip, but only about 25 of those were in Antarctica proper. So not a lot of bird diversity there either. So uh, penguins, obviously, that's the, the namesake uh, of the bird world down there, at least the thing that people associate the most. With Antarctica, you know, we saw this this guy on the, the cover photo. This is a, a Gen 2 penguin. Um, it's probably one of the more common ones down there. There really are three common species. So we saw these uh, at many of the colonies that we visited. Uh, very charismatic. They're the largest of the three common ones there. Um, kind of middle-sized one, and, and probably maybe my favorite among the three was the chin strap penguins. I know Julie likes the Gen 2s. I think chin straps are they're kind of the the real snappy looking ones. Uh, <laughs> A little bit slimmer, a little smaller than a Gen 2. Uh, just really cool. It's, it's some really neat behaviors in all of these. We'll see a little bit of that in a moment. And then the smallest one, um, as, as Augustin, the tour guide, said, the schizophrenic ones. These are adelies. Uh, and it's true that when you get up kind of close to a bunch of these, they tend to just kind of wander around back and forth, and they just can't quite figure out what to do, and then they all just jump in the water. Uh, so <laughs> adelie penguins was kind of the third common species. And we saw um, usually usually one or two of these in each of the colonies. One of the big colonies, it turned out, had all three of them breeding, but typically they were segregated out of it. And penguins, uh, you encounter them lots of ways. Uh, we saw our first Antarctic penguins before we got to the South Shetlands, and anytime you see icebergs get an area that's got lots of ice, this is a real typical scene there. Uh, these are some chin strap penguins sitting on the ice, and then you can see a whole bunch of them, just hundreds of them swimming around. That was real, real typical view there, just sitting on ice. Um, sometimes you counter just flocks of them that are heading out to feed, so swimming on the surface of the water. Uh, if you're really lucky, like John Neville's photo that I borrowed for this, you can get them porpoising. And so when you're actually, when you're a surprising distance from Antarctica, like 100 miles north or more, we saw some of these, uh, with the dailies and chin straps in particular. And so they just porpoise right along like dolphins, uh, just kind of out of the water. It's amazing how quickly they travel. It's easy to understand how they can cover so much distance from Antarctica. And they're just real charismatic. You can go up to most of the landings that we made, and this is a real typical uh, view of what we might see as a greeting party. Some, uh, some Gen 2s just kind of hanging out, really, really tame. I mean, you, you were permitted to be no closer than five meters from the colonies. Frequently, you'd be, when we were walking down the trail, of course, the trail would punch about you know, a foot deep in the snow after 88 passengers walked down it. And sometimes, actually, the penguins would come up and try to cross that trail and have a little bit of a trouble. They'd jump down in it. And then they'd sit there and try to scramble off the side, and if they couldn't make it, 
they'd often walk up and down the trail. And sometimes you'd have be sitting there and there'd be a Gen 2 penguin a few feet from you and you'd step back off of the trail and let them walk by and find a better place to get up. So they were very, very accommodating uh, with respect to seeing close. And just kind of hanging out, other Gen 2 penguins there on some snow. Every once in a while you notice some interesting behaviors. I was like this image there, just kind of checking out the water this week on. I think our first landing there, they were kind of looking for, presume some food in the water there or something, but they're constantly sticking heads in the water. And then when you get up to some of the bigger colonies, it's real common to have these big flocks. So these are a bunch of the daily penguins uh, that are kind of hanging out on the edge. They're all waiting to go back out to sea to feed. So they, you know, they switch incubation duties because they're incubating eggs at this time. And so they kind of wait in mass and then they all jump in. They're hoping to avoid predation by having lots of them in the water at once just in case there's a leopard seal hanging out there. And so again, another uh, big daily colony there, just standing around on the ice, these would be birds that are uh, not on eggs at the moment, but they probably, their bait is on eggs uh, somewhere back on the, on the toehold there. Some of them picked really nice places for nesting colonies, a, a colony with a view, so to speak. So this is uh, on top of one of our landings, and this is a, a nesting colony of Gen 2 penguins. And so anytime they want to switch duties, they climb all the way from the ocean up several hundred meters in elevation, and they do it remarkably well. They get these little trails through the snow, and they just sort of, you know, all the way up there, do their thing for a day or so, and switch out with their mate, and walk back down, or in some cases, slide back down. But remarkable how, how much elevation they cover on a regular basis. And these colonies, some of them at least, are imminent. I mean, like tens of thousands of individuals. So this is a, a colony. Um, on one of the slopes there is just a piece of the colony, but there are just you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of birds in there on nests, and that's well, certainly not a terribly large colony. There's another one just showing some of the, um, the vegetation there a little bit in the background, but these are all, all this kind of line in there is all just solid penguins on nests there, and again, mostly um, Gen 2s on a daily these, these last two slopes. I like this one. This is a Gen 2 colony. This was actually our last landing before we headed back to the main continent. And uh, notice this, it's a, it's a whale vertebrae uh, laying there, probably, presumably from some of the whaling uh, that had taken place in Antarctica a century earlier. Maybe it was one that died and washed up. I thought it was kind of interesting. There were a bunch of Gen 2s just kind of standing around like it was a dinner table, and I kept thinking they must just be waiting for somebody to put something there to eat. But uh, nonetheless, uh, kind of neat to see those there. We did, at one of our stops, at the, there was a Chilean base, naval base that we visited, and there were actually a couple of um, leucistic, so partially albino Gen 2 penguins. It was a colony that apparently has two or three of those at any one time, and this is one of those individuals, so you do see some, some aberrations on those occasionally. And one of the things that was really neat behaviorally about the penguins is this pebble carry. So they have this uh, nest that's constructed out of little stones, and if you just sit, and watch them, stand by a penguin colony for a while, and watch them, particularly the Gen 2s. It's just a constant circling of stealing a pebble from your neighbor and walking back to your nest, and while you're doing that, one of your neighbors is stealing your nest. <laughs> it literally would be kind of fascinating to know on what basis the stones are circulated amongst the colony, because I'm sure it's regular. It certainly was a, it was a fun activity to watch. So this individual <coughs> taking a stone from somebody, and here's another one that uh, definitely has stolen this stone and is headed back to its nest. They're just constantly doing this. It's really fun to just sit there and watch them. They're very charismatic critters. The chin straps, maybe more so than the Gen 2s, were very prone to squabbles. And so these are a couple of males that were making a lot of noise, fighting each other. They kind of go through this low threat display. Just lots and lots of fun behaviors to just sit and watch. It was really fun to sit there for 30 minutes and just listen and watch any of the penguin colonies. And as I said, sometimes, uh, Despite the fact that it's hard to walk up the mountain, sometimes they just slide right down. So occasionally we'd see them just plop on their belly and kind of push with their back legs, and that was a, seemed to be a pretty efficient way to travel down slope on snow. They certainly did it uh, much more quickly than they walked. And then this was uh, the one different penguin that we saw in Antarctica. So the three common species are widespread. Beyond that, it's really unusual to see any. And this is a, a sub-Antarctic penguin called the macaroni penguin. We saw one of those at one of the colonies, and that's not a, a bird that you normally expect. There's one unexpected bird we saw in Antarctica, and this was it. And then just a couple of slides to show you some of the other bird life besides penguins, and there, and there were a little of them. This is an endemic down there called an Antarctic shag. It's a species of cormorant that's endemic down there. It's the only one of its, um, of its order that would be down there. It's a fish eater, not surprising. Um, one of the other really fun charismatic ones is a snowy sheepbill. 
It's kind of a, it's a, a in its own unique family of birds. There's no other close relatives. And uh, a couple things to note: it's got a fan on its leg. I still haven't tracked down where that wolf came from. But these are uh, these are the scavengers of the penguin colonies. They eat everything: dung, uh, pieces of eggs, uh, carcasses, anything like that. And they're very very approachable. They'll fly right up and walk around at your feet sometimes. They're very uh, a fun bird, a snowy sheep bill. One of my favorites, a snow petrel. So there are a couple of species of seabirds that are endemic to the Antarctic continent itself. This is one of them, the other being an Antarctic petrel. These are a snow white petrel. We saw good numbers of these for about two hours one day when we were along the edge of the pack ice. And they're really a bird of the pack ice and nest on steep cliffs. So very hard to get close to many of those snow petrel. And then this is probably the top bird predator. This is a, an Antarctic skua. So it's a gull-like bird, a nice heavy hooked bill. Uh, anytime you're in penguin colonies, these were flying around looking to steal penguin eggs. And that's what this bird has right here. It's stolen a, a penguin egg and, and crushed it open and eaten that. And that happened frequently. I think probably every penguin colony we were in, we either saw evidence of it or we saw skuas that actually had eggs. And then, I think last but not least, this is an Antarctic tern. So again, it's the only tern that's in Antarctica, uh, endemic to the continent, although it winters a little further north of that, along the edge of the Antarctic pack ice. And so, I think that's, so hold on here, we'll take those in a moment. I'm going to show you just a very brief video here. So this is a video that uh, was essentially created mostly by the students by carrying GoPros, mostly on their heads. So if you're prone to motion sickness, brace yourself. said earlier, you cannot describe the immensity of the landscape. And there's no sound. So. Not yet. It's kind of just, we're doing a panoramic around the boat here. You get a little sense of what's there. Maybe you guys can say my pleasant We were hoping that you would come up. And well, I have heard Audience participation. No yeah. 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 yeah, the nice thing about this particular boat is that it's small enough that there aren't too many people, uh, but it's big enough that there are multiple decks and multiple places to go outside. And so we had, except in the Great Passage, one day when it was so rough that we weren't allowed to be outside, you could spend 24 hours a day outside looking at, at stuff. You could also go visit with the captain if you wanted to as well, to kind of see things from his point of view. But And we should also thank Bill Shoemaker in the back for aggregating this material for us. So this was a, a ritual every time we made a landing. There's a stack of zodiacs on the back of the boat there, so they hoist them up, uh, have these guidelines to help guide them, put them over the side, drop them down, they get down to a, a level of a lower deck there, and the boat operator steps in, still suspended over the water though, drop it into the water, unhook it, Turn the motor on and back away. This was deadly efficient in terms of unloading six or seven zodiacs. And then the loading process. So after we've cleaned our feet, we climb down this little gangplank. It was kind of shaky. So And of course, the boat ride over with something attached it's to your head. The penguins that you can see. Right there. Right there. <laughs> Welcoming committee of some penguins there. Right? GoPros are great, but it's hard to get steady footage when you're in an environment that's got lots of wind and rocking water. So this is going to be the 
Leopard seal. Yeah, it gets better than flush. <laughs> That's close. She was looking at our zodiac practice eyes. Big red seal. And we saw it immediately after that guy there said, oh, we won't see a leopard seal on this trip. <laughs> Literally, immediately. So zodiacs are 15 feet? Um, something like that. Uh, yeah. Leopard seals, 10 or 12? Big, oh, yeah. That's a big seal. Mm -hmm. So he does her head in the water here? <laughs> what a few filters. Go. So that's what we had to say. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks. Questions, comments? Appropriate. So, what were the other 